All right. Hello, everyone. Um, the title for this uh, study it's called "Application of Sepsural Measures in Cantonese-Speaking Patients with Muscle Tension, Dysphonia, and Benign Vocal Fold Lesions." I'm Raymond. Uh, I'm doing this uh, talk or this study as part of my hospital, Queen Mary Hospital, and. Um, I've previously submitted a, the abstract for this talk, but um, some of the well, the methodology has been the same, but the results and the conclusion uh, has since been updated because we have some updated data. So um, stay tuned to the following presentation instead of just reading the abstract. If you could find it somewhere online. Um, the background of this project was pretty simple. It started off as a mini CQI project. Uh, the reason for that was because the voice assessment protocol that was used uh, widely across clinics in uh, in speech therapy clinics in the hospital authority was revamped and standardized in 2015, and it was uh, it was endorsed by our um, uh, coordinating committee. Um, in 2016, so it was in full use since it has been in full use since last year, and um, we standardized uh, all sorts of things, including the uh, case history background, um, the the questions that we would ask our patients regarding their voice and our vocal and medical history, and uh, we adopted the use of VHI as our quality of life measurements and um, CANPATH for the perceptual evaluation. And the uh, highlight of his talk would be on the acoustic measurements. And uh, from the discussion, we decided to use sepstral and spect spectral measurements um, instead of the uh, traditional ones, uh, which I'll be going over or uh, going over them later on. And so this mini CQI project in our, in our department was after the introduction and using this voice assessment protocol, we wanted to think about you know how to make better sense out of this protocol. How, well, since we're going to use it, so how are we going to make better sense out of it? And just a little bit on the acoustic measurements in dysphonia management, the traditional measurements which can be um, obtained by Pratt and um, MDBP, the multi-dimensional voice profile, something like that. Um, the the traditional measurements would include uh, fundamental frequency, jitter and shimmer, and some derived uh, uh, parameter, including the relative amplitude perturbation, RAP, or the APQ, or um, uh, noise to harmonic ratio. Um, the same program, Pratt could also come up with these sepstral and spectral measurements, and also um, the commercially available program called ADSV, which is also produced by K Pentax. And sepstral measurements, the common ones would include um, CPP, which is in sh uh, short the short form for sepstral peak pro prominence, um, a uh, the spectral ratio of in in low and high frequency, the LH ratio. And a derived parameter from which can be computed through ADSV, and that's called the CSID. So what are all these things? Now, sepstral peak prominence CPP, in short, it's the ratio of the automatically identified peak to the expected amplitude of the peak. And so this um, relative amplitude of the peak in the sepstrum. Uh, which represents the dominant harmonic of the acoustic signal, okay, uh, in both vowels and connected speech samples. Uh, in short, or, or in layman's sense, what we tell our patients is that um, CPP essentially refers to how how your voice stands out from noise. Noise, not not referring to background noise or noise in the um, uh, ambient environment. But noise in the voice. Okay, so if a patient has a really, really breathy voice, then the breathiness or the hoarseness in the voice, it's it's the voice, it's, it's the noise itself. Okay, so the ratio of it would be low because the the noise would 
be very, very similar to the actual voice of the patient. So this is how we usually explain it. And to get a good voice, your or to if you have a good voice, your CPP would uh, would be high. And this was this CPP was actually the recommended acoustic measurement for vocal function, which is related to uh, uh, vocal signal quality. So it has been um, recommended even by ASHA that this would be a good correlate to vocal signal quality, whereas the frequency would be correlated by um, the uh, fundamental frequency and or, or the frequency range or the standard deviation of such. And the amplitude would be the, um, the habitual sound pressure level and the maximum and the minimum vocal sound pressure level. And apart from the CPP value itself, the CPP SD, which is the standard deviation of the CPP across the sample, the variability of CPP, it's also a parameter that um, we would use for sepsial measures. So you could you you would be able to imagine that um, like the CPP of a uh, of a uh, vowel prolongation. Uh, the CPP SD of a vowel prolongation would be low because it shouldn't have a lot of um, variance. But um, for the uh, um, for a CPP SD of a connected speech, the the value should be higher. The higher the better because we would need to have that um, you know uh, prosodic component in our speech to make it sound nice and. Um, in the commercially available program, the ADSV, um, you would able to get a, uh, a derived parameter, which is the CSID, in short for um, the sepstral spectral index of dysphonia. Uh, this index, it's a it uses a multivariate approach, and it's a mathematically derived formula, which is based on 160 samples um, of foreign speakers. They, um, the the samples um, are all speaking Cape V sentences, and so basically because they're in English, so it's not applicable except for the vowel R. And here is an um, just a screenshot of what MDVP would look like. Um, it's say it would give uh, uh, it would give you the value of the F node and the um, the RAP and the APQ. So this voice here, which is a dysphonic voice, a dysphonic R, you'll get a high RAP and a high APQ. And um, at the same time, if we put this through sepsial analysis, you would see that the CPP value it's is actually low. It's only 1.39 decibels, and the SD is quite high because there's variance in it. And that's the value for the low to high ratio. We were away a year ago. And this is the a screenshot of um, ADSV. If you can see that this um, this window here shows the spectrum, and this, and the one circled here would correspond to the um, to the CPP. Um, uh, this is where the, uh, the uh, CPP value lies. And um, this is a dysphonic patient, um, if I remembered correctly. Um, she was a patient with focal fold paralysis and she speaks English. So I got her to say a, an all, say the all voice sentence in KP, which was, we were away a year ago. Okay, let's listen to that again. And the CPP, you can see it's it's um it's not really high, and um, the most important aspect would be the CSID, which is twenty eight, and the cutoff is twenty. So um, we would able to say that this patient has a mild um, dysphonia from this CSID speech. So so why don't we use it more often? Well. Now there's a research gap to it because there's no normative data locally. 
And so the um, all these measures, no matter if they are on R or the passage reading, uh, mostly they can only be used for intra um, patient, so pre and post comparison. So the research question that we had in our mind was, so which parameter or parameters is or are more sensitive to represent the improvement in voice quality of our dysphonic patients. And in our clinic, our patients are discharged when they have attained overall improvement in their voice. So and our clinicians do not just rely on a single modality or parameter. So therefore, comparing pre and post sepsural measurements and their respective um, statistical significance should answer this question. So our research um, or mini project, um, research may be an overstatement, uh, um, the, the methods of um, this project was actually pretty simple. Uh, we looked at our patient um, uh, database and we, um, we, we retrieved those all those patients who had at least one session of voice therapy that were discharged in 2016 and this year until the 1st of August. So that was a 19 months of patients and we totally identified 77 patients. Unfortunately, we had to ex exclude 50 of them because 27 of them used MDVP as their initial or um, both initial and post-treatment measurements, so this is not our focus. And 23 of them did not have post-treatment um, acoustic assessment. So I think the first learning point here is really obvious that um, for all those clinicians or student clinicians out there, remember to take your post-treatment data um, because that would be a really strong thing to do, especially in terms of research or just looking back and see whether the things that you do are, uh, are, are correct or not, or are valid or not. So we were able to include 27 subjects and um, we further excluded seven more because four of them suffered from vocal fold paralysis and the nature of it was a little bit different from the, the um the majority of our subjects, two had spasmodic dysphonia and one had vocal fold leukoplakia, which um, underwent surgery and not voice therapy. So the eventual number of subjects was 20. And we did a retrospective review of their progress notes on the ENT diagnosis, the voice treatment component. Uh, we made sure that they had pre and post sepsural uh, spectral assessment data, and so it was all uniform because it, they, they all followed the protocol. So CPP, CPP-SD, and the CSID of vowel prolongation. Uh, we asked, the, the usual way of doing it is that we asked the patient to say R ah, for like two to three seconds, and we take the middle one second of it for analysis. And we also got them to um, to say this, the uh, to read the Hong Kong passage, and we get them to start reading it, and we took... Um, the second and third sentence of the passage um, uh, and then we took it for analysis for CPP and CPPSD and obviously well, we also took a look at um, the discharge reason to make sure that these patients were discharged based on a clinical decision and not just uh, that they defaulted or for discharge for some other reason. Uh, we had five males, 15 females, and the mean age was 50. Uh, the mean number of sessions they got was 7.25. Uh, seven of them had MTD, 11 had um, all, all kinds of benign vocal fold um, lesions. Uh, two had granuloma, uh, one had granuloma, and one had a uh, vocal fold amyloidosis. And the chart shows that the uh, the the distribution of the main component of voice therapy, most of them received resonant voice therapy, some received um, semi occluded voice tract exercise. And here are the results. You can see that the, um, the CPP in vowel prolongation are pre and post, um, they all improved. Well, they, uh, for, except for two, two patients, of uh, three patients, uh, most of them improved and the mean was from 9.45 decibels to 10.63.
uh, and this was a using a pet samples t test. This was um, statistically significant. The CPPSD, likewise, um, it was also statistically significant that the pre and post um, uh, the the post treatment score was lower, which was an indication of an improvement in their CPP in their voice. The CSID also improved the mean CSID pre-treatment was 23 to post-treatment was 12. So uh, we managed to get um, all, uh, all but two patients under the uh, uh, within the normative range um, so that they're not regarded as dysphonic if we're just using CSID. Uh, this was also statistically significant. As for the um, passage reading, the CPP remained. Um, they they also it they also improved in terms of their mean CPP uh, uh, scores, but um, however, this 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 did not reach statistical significance. As for the CPP SD, likewise, it improved in terms of um, the the value from three point oh one to three point two six. However, um, pet samples t test did not show a statistically significant result. So, um, mind you that this study was based on an assumption that the patients were discharged after having attained, uh, after attaining over improvement in the voice, and so we compared the pre and post sepsial measurements to see which were most sensitive. And the result, we were able to conclude that the um, parameters using prolongation of R, but not passage reading, were more sensitive uh, ac ac across the board. So CPP, CPPSD, and CSID of uh, vowel prolongation were more sensitive. And I think um, a reason to, to, to support that was that the sepsial measures are more sensitive towards all voice sentences. This was from a clinical um, observation standpoint, um, um, and also I think it was mentioned in in the um, articles by by um, K Pentex, um, the company who it's widely using um, sepsial measures. So um, as R and R obviously is an all voiced um, voice all voiced uh, speech sample as compared to the second and third. Um, sentence of the Hong Kong passage. So we might need to refine our stimuli or use um, multiple stimuli so that the uh, a all voiced um, sentence would be in, in Cantonese would be used as uh, the sexual measurements um, for um, evaluating Cantonese speaking patients. And another reason which we postulated but we don't we don't want it to be true was that the effectiveness of our, of our treatment, although we, we, we made the clinical decision that they improved overall, but in fact, the treatment was not effective at reading or at conversational level. Um, I doubt that this is true. Well, I certainly hope not that, hope that this is not true. And um, of course, it would have to be supported by not just my words, but it has to be supported by uh, um, other data from our perceptual uh, or VHI measurements. But um, this is not the scope of this study. So um, we certainly hope that this is not true, but um, this could be one of the reasons why. And so what does this study tell us? Um, I think the future direction of using sexual measurements is that, first of all, we have to do certain studies that would correlate it with perceptual evaluation results. Okay, Percep correlating it with other assessments like CANPATH. So, what kind of a score would correlate to like a three or a six on a CANPATH um, breathiness uh, um, um, parameter? And of course, correlating it with the uh, QOL measures, um, the VHI would be of um, good clinical value so that we would know, uh, we would be able to make a decision from a more comprehensive standpoint. And apart from that, we would also need to have normative data um, 
or uh, for for both file prolongation and um, and passage or sentence reading, because if we have that, then we could replicate the original study and come up with the local CSID, and this would be a very diagnostic useful tool um, to tell patients that okay so you only have like a CSID of 15 then you don't need to worry about your voice in terms of um, acoustic uh, measurements so for now I think we have to exercise and interpret uh, um, the results of uh, sexual measures on passage reading with caution because um, I'm not saying that it's not useful, but um, it might not be able to reflect the changes of our voice therapy or in particular in Canadian speaking patients um, or those who is using these two sentences for um, um, pre and post treatment evaluation. So um, yeah, I that's pretty much what I want to present. And I would very much like to thank uh, my colleagues at Queen Mary Hospital, um, I think they deliver um, excellent. Uh, I think you know you could see that they develop they deliver uh, voice therapy with quite excellent results, and um, this is an indication of that it works. And I think I'm, we're going to share this with our ENT colleagues so that they would also know that uh, the voice therapy that we do it's actually useful. And apart from my colleagues, I would also like to thank the members of the Voice Task Force um, because it is them who came up with the standardization of the voice assessment protocol. I think that's what is, that was a big step for us to, to, uh, to ditch some of the old stuff and use some of the new stuff. Um, and also, last but not least, I really need to thank our volunteers from our summer volunteer program. They were the one who 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 um, looked up and find the result uh, and filtered some of the results, uh, did the data mining and data collection for us. And so um, it was it was very nice of them to do it. Okay, so here is um, just a list of my references, and thank you.